Hi, welcome back to Philosophy 101E, Morals in Society from Honolulu Community College, and I am Chris Ann Moore. On today's show, Program 8, we will be doing Socrates and Objective Ethics. But before we start talking about Socrates, I want to go over some of the points that we hit last week, um, last episode. Because actually in the last episode we covered a lot of information and that information is essential to understanding moral theory. So we're going to go over that and then we're going to look at Socrates' response to that moral theory. Last week we were talking about Athens in the 5th century. Now this was the golden age of Athens. It was the Periclean democracy. Athens had become a very prosperous trading port. Um, this was the age of great sculpture, great architecture, incredible theater, drama, tragedy. But this was also a time of psychological crisis for the Athenian people. Why? Well, it was a whole new lifestyle. And a whole new lifestyle, each individual is faced with whole new questions. And the old answers didn't seem to be addressing these new questions quite so well. And of, the Athenians were confronted with a lot of new things. Uh, they had Many foreigners had moved in to Athens. And in addition, in trading and in warfare, the Athenians had become acquainted with other cultures. And as they became acquainted with other cultures, for one thing, the Athenian sense of superiority was challenged because the Athenians were ethnocentric, as many people are, which is that they believed that their culture and their beliefs were superior to any others. But as foreigners moved into Athens, some of them outdid the Athenians in business savvy and in smarts. And so the Athenians began to question themselves. Also, as they moved into the modern era of the 5th century BC, many of the Athenians began to question the old gods and goddesses that had been handed down by the tales of Homer and Hesiod, the stories of Zeus and Athena, of Artemis and Aphrodite, of Ares and Apollo. Because in these stories, these gods committed adultery, they lied, they stole, as Xenophanes had said, Homer and Hesiod have attributed to the gods those characteristics which are considered a scandal among human beings. In addition to all of this, Athens was thrown into the Peloponnesian Wars at the end of the 5th century. This war between Athens and Sparta lasted for 20 years. Now, during the course of this war, Athenians began to disagree with one another about how the war was being conducted, whether they should be involved in the war. And what was worst of all is Athens lost the war eventually. Sparta won. And so Athenians began to question, how should I live? And how do I find the answers to that question, how should I live? See, the Athenians, like most people, had thought that morality is objective. The morality is like a law of nature. It is universally true, true for everyone at all times. Like gravity. Gravity affects me and it affects you and it affects everyone else exactly the same way. And Athenians had thought moral law was like that. But further, they thought they knew what that moral law was. But with the new questions and the new lifestyle of the fifth century, that wasn't so apparent anymore. And so a kind of moral skepticism became introduced into the Athenian culture. Now, moral skepticism is doubt that any such universal morality exists. Or, if it exists, doubt that we can know what it is. Now, into this breach of moral skepticism came a new brand of teacher, the sophists. Now, the sophists were well-traveled and sophisticated, as we said, and the sophists were really the first professional educators. They charged for their services. And what the sophists promised to teach was how to be successful. You see, the sophists had determined that human happiness was acquired by wealth, power, beauty. And of course, of those, most importantly, power. Because if one had power, one could acquire what one wanted. And even more importantly, one could hold on to it. And so, the sophists purported to teach the young men of Athens how to be successful. Now, how one was successful in 5th century Greece, well, one of the major components was being able to be an elegant and effective and persuasive speaker. Athenians 
were litigious. Athens was a litigious society. In other words, people were suing people all the time. Now, the Athenian courts were made up of 500 to 1,000 jury members. And who won in a lawsuit? Well, who won was that the person who was most able to convince the Athenian jury of the rightness of their cause. But what about the rightness of it, that cause? Did it matter if what you were speaking on was right or wrong, true or false? The sophist said no, that it was ridiculous to ask if something was right or wrong or true or false. Because the sophists claim that all values are relative. That the only thing one needed to ask is, is it advantageous to me? See, the sophists put forward the idea, it's not how you play the game. It's whether you win or lose. Think about that. It's not how you play the game. It's whether you win or lose. So to the sophists, the most important thing was winning. As far as right and wrong or true or false, the sophist said it's relative. That morality, in fact, was relative. What does relative mean? It means dependent. That to the sophists, morals were just something human beings made up. There was no universal moral law that was true for all human beings. To the sophists, morality was created by individuals and culture. Now, mo all moral theories, well, no, not all, most moral theories are either objective moral theories or relative moral theories. Objective moral theories believe that morality is universal. In other words, if slavery is wrong for me, it's wrong for you. If lying is wrong for me, it's wrong for you. That morals don't change from person to person or culture to culture because they are like laws of nature. The sophists, on the other hand, proposed a relative moral theory. There are many relative moral theories, but all of, this have, all of them have this in common. They do not believe that morals are like laws of nature. They believe that morals are something that human beings make up, that morals are a matter of opinion, of culture, or power. See, there's three moral theories, relative moral theories we looked at last week. Cultural relativism, whatever the culture says is right, is right. Individual relativism, Whatever the individual says is right, is right. And last of all, moral realism, which is simply, let's get real. Who makes laws? Those in power. Who do they make them for? Themselves. So who determines right from, who determines right from wrong? The powerful. Of course, the moral realist took this a step further and said, not only do the powerful determine right and wrong, they should. You see, the moral realist thought that some people are smarter, braver, better than others. That we are not all equal. And so those who are the best should rule, and those who are the best should be the most powerful, and they determine right and wrong. Now, last week we looked at the problems with those kind of theories. Cultural relativism, well, if whatever the culture says is right is right, all moral reformers are wrong. The Mahatma Gandhis, the Martin Luther Kings, the Nelson Mandela's, the Henry David Thoreau's are wrong something wrong with that. And of course, if you only have to determine right and wrong by the culture, what is a culture? Now, it may seem clear if you live in a tribal culture where everyone looks the same and everyone has the same values, but that certainly isn't true today, and it wasn't really true for Athens then. Cultures are a mixture of different cultures. Look at America today with all the different cultures that are in America. How would we determine morality by culture? Individual relativism has even a bigger problem. Individual relativism leaves us no moral standards whatsoever. According to individual relativism, whatever I think is right is right, and whatever you think is right is right for you. But it leaves us no standard to judge morality by individual relativism, Mahatma Gandhi, and a serial killer. Equally right. Mother Teresa and Hitler, equally right. There are even bigger problems with moral realism. First of all, moral realism is based on a misinterpretation of nature. Nature is as dependent, if not more dependent, on cooperation as it is on competition. And furthermore, in human nature, rights are not dependent on abilities. Yes, there are people who are stronger and more talented than others. Life is not fair.
but that doesn't mean they don't have equal rights. But perhaps the greatest condemnation of relativism was the effect that it had on Athens in 5th century BC, at least at that time, because moral relativism had led to extensive corruption. And the extensive corruption would ensure that the Athenian Golden Age would end and that Athens would once more melt into eventual obscurity on the world stage. But before that happened, one individual spent his entire life trying to refute moral relativism, trying to wake the Athenians up, trying to make them understand that morality is not a matter of opinion, that morality is not a matter of culture, that morality is not a matter of the whims of those in power, that morality is objective, it is universal, and it is knowable. And that is Socrates. And that is who we're going to look at today. Socrates. Socrates lived from 470 to 399 BC in Athens. Socrates was born of a father who was a sculptor. His mother was a midwife. And by all accounts, Socrates is what we would call very solidly middle class. However, through his life and his work, Socrates has become one of the most influential people in history. Socrates' life and work was, as I said, based on one main idea. And that idea is that morality is not relative. That morality is not relative. Morality is objective. And morality is knowable. Because of his efforts, Socrates has been called by the 14th Dalai Lama an enlightened individual. Many of the church fathers actually have called Socrates a Christian before Christ. And it is generally understood that the Christian message would not have taken the form that it took or been understood in the way that it was understood if the way had not been paved by Socrates and his, students, and his student Plato. Socrates was an unusual individual by all accounts. He had been a soldier, and by the report of other soldiers was extraordinarily brave. It was said that he was the last to leave any battle. It was also said that in the winter in the mountains, Socrates was so unaffected by the weather that he continued to walk in bare feet and in fact shamed the other soldiers who were sick and tired of the cold. Socrates was also, by all accounts, extremely ugly. He had protruding eyes and a flat nose that was turned up, and he had what he himself called a belly way too large for convenience. But Socrates was not concerned about the standards of beauty that most Athenians seemed to be obsessed with. In fact, Socrates thought that beauty was inner beauty, that beauty indeed was beauty of the soul and of character. Socrates was not concerned either with the wealth that seemed to obsess most Athenians and obsesses most Americans today. Socrates wore one old cloak about Athens. He walked barefoot. And although he had many opportunities to acquire wealth, he never pursued them. He pursued instead his goal of waking the Athenians up, of having them realize that morality was not only knowable, but it was essential to their own happiness. That Socrates had an unusual destiny was confirmed when his, his friend, Sheriffon, went to the oracle at Delphi. Now Delphi, which was outside of Athens, quite a ways outside of Athens actually, Delphi was considered the center of the Greek world. and In fact, it was called the navel of the Greek world. And at Delphi, for thousands of years, priestesses would go into trance and prophesy. And these prophecies were taken quite seriously. These prophecies molded political strategies, and they deeply affected personal lives. Now, when Sheriffon went to the oracle at Delphi, and he finally got to see her, she said to him, there is no man wiser than Socrates. Well, Sheriffon went running back to Athens and said to Socrates, the oracle at Delphi says there is no man wiser than you. Socrates was actually quite shocked. Socrates was convinced that he had no wisdom in him. So he was unsure as to what the oracle could have been referring to. So this began Socrates on a search for wisdom. 
he wanted to find out what the oracle could have meant. And so what Socrates did is he went to the wise men of Athens. In other words, he went to those that the people thought were wise, and as Socrates said, thought themselves wiser still. Socrates went to meet these wise men, and he began to question them. But as he questioned them, it became quite clear to him that they didn't know what they were talking about. It became quite clear to Socrates that they had no wisdom in them. And so Socrates realized that he was indeed wiser than they were. Why? Because they knew nothing, but they thought they knew everything. Socrates knew nothing, but Socrates knew he knew nothing. And this, of course, has become the definition of Socratic wisdom. Socratic wisdom is to know that you don't know. In this, Socrates actually echoes one of Lao Tzu's writings. Lao Tzu had wrote, written, to know and yet think you do not know is best. What do Socrates and Lao Tzu mean by this? Well, Socrates and Lao Tzu retain the humbleness and openness that we talked about in chapter 3 that is so essential to the search for wisdom, that is so essential to learning. Because you see, when you think you know, learning stops. In fact, the students who are hardest to teach are not the ones who are frightened about what they don't know. The hardest te students to teach are those who think they already know. Socrates and Lao Tzu both, reali both realized that on the journey towards wisdom, one must remain open. One must know that they don't know so they can learn, so they can be humble. Further, Socrates believed that only the gods are wise and said so. In fact, Socrates said when he prayed, he prayed only for those gifts the gods would give, for only the gods know what gifts are best. In other words, Socrates basically was saying, the gods will be done. Socrates, too, believed in the sacrifice of personal will, of not forcing his will, but instead seeking to fulfill the will of the gods. In this, too, he was similar to Lao Tzu. Of course, Lao Tzu was not talking about the gods or a personal god. But this idea of sacrificing personal will is very present in Socrates' entire life. In fact, Socrates came to believe that the gods had assigned him the mission to teach philosophy to the citizens of Athens. And as Socrates began on that mission, it became clear that, like Lao Tzu, although he knew he didn't know, he was quite assured of some things. And one of the things that Socrates was assured of is that wealth and power and beauty do not ensure happiness. Most of the Athenians disagreed with him. Most Americans disagree with him. Most people today are convinced, as the Athenians were then, that if they had enough money, or they had enough beauty, or they had enough power, that they would indeed be happy. In fact, most people spend their entire lives searching after these things despite the enormous amount of evidence to the contrary. There is an enormous amount of evidence that health and beauty and wealth do not account make for happiness. We're all well aware Kurt Cobain, Freddie Prince, John Belushi, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Judy Garland, Elvis Presley. What do all these people have in common? They had succeeded in acquiring the wealth and the power, and most often the beauty that most of us long for. And yet they ended their lives in misery, in suicide, and or in drug addiction. Have you ever watched E! True Hollywood Story? Have you ever watched VH1 Behind the Music? These are morality tales. Again and again, these stories of people who have that the rest of us are looking for. They're stories of people who have achieved fame and fortune. For the most part, they're gorgeous. And yet, so many of them are miserable. You watch on VH1 and they're like, I'm going to get back to the top someday. Yet they were so happy when they were on the top? No! And yet, 
Here we are pursuing wealth and power and beauty with all our might and all our time and all our energies. As a matter of fact, late night TV infomercials that promise these things, self-help books that'll show you their easy acquisition, which is doubtful, they make millions of dollars. So what is the problem here? Well, one of the problems is oversimplified thinking. You see, when I say to my students, wealth and power and beauty will not make you happy, they get very silent and look at me very suspiciously because they think that I'm saying that they need to be poor and powerless. They think that I'm saying that they have to give up their desires for money and their desire for beauty and their desire for power and instead accept poverty and powerlessness. That is not what I'm saying. Although there is plenty of evidence that wealth and beauty and power will not make you happy, and there is evidence that being poor and powerless or having minimal power, you can still be happy. But there is no evidence that being poor ensures happiness. As a matter of fact, most people who are poverty stricken cannot be happy. You cannot be happy when you cannot feed your children. You cannot be happy when you don't know how you're going to pay your rent. You cannot be happy when you can't provide basic medical necessities for your family and for yourself. Most religious people who take vows of poverty do so in institutions in which their shelter and clothing and food is going to be provided for them. The ascetic hermit is, not, is a very unusual character. And the ascetic hermit is usually found in those cultures where the culture provides for ascetic hermits. So, wealth and power and beauty do not ensure happiness. Poverty, being poor, does not ensure happiness. To think that this means that, to say that wealth, power, and beauty do not ensure happiness means you have to accept poverty and powerlessness is ridiculous. This is black and white thinking. First of all, there are many ranges of wealth between poor and rich. Furthermore, there are many degrees and forms of power. But to say that wealth and power and beauty do not ensure happiness is simply saying that something else is necessary. To say that one can be poor and happy says that this something else is so important that it is the key ingredient. In fact, this something else is so important that when one has power and wealth, perhaps it becomes even more necessary to prevent the kind of self-destructiveness that we see in those people that we talked about before. And for Socrates, what was this thing? It was goodness. It was morality. You see, Socrates taught that one could no more be immoral and happy than one could be sick and be healthy. That in fact, goodness is necessary for happiness. Now, you may very well be thinking what many of my students do think. They think, well, hey, I know some very cruel, unjust people who look pretty happy to me. The Athenians said the same thing to Socrates. Socrates countered that you cannot tell if someone is happy or not by the way they look. Happiness is an internal condition. And so certainly we must conclude that Socrates, at least in this, is correct. You cannot look at someone and know if they are happy or unhappy. Socrates argued not only is goodness necessary for happiness, but more importantly, he argued that the moral morality is objective and universal, objective, universal, and knowable. How? Well, Socrates argued, we have these ideas. We have an idea of perfect justice. We have an idea of perfect beauty. We have an idea of perfect equality. There is no doubt we have these ideas because we compare everything we encounter to them. We say this is more or less just. This is more or less beautiful. This is more or less equal treatment. How can we compare things if we don't know what perfect justice, perfect beauty, and perfect equality are? We do. We do know. And yet, we have never experienced perfect justice. We have never experienced perfect beauty. We have never experienced perfect equality.
So how can we have these ideas? Well, if we have these ideas of perfect justice, perfect beauty, perfect equality, etc., and they do not come from experience, then these ideas are a priori ideas. These ideas are the self-evident universal truths that we talked about in chapter 3. Recall for a second, in chapter 3 it became quite obvious, I hope, that you cannot derive a universal eternal truth from experience. Experience is limited. Experience is relative. Experience actually can be deceptive. So, in order to arrive at a universal eternal truth, one must use deductive logic. But in order to arrive at universal truth using deductive logic, you have to begin with universal truth. Where are you going to find them? Well, there must be ideas which are not dependent on experience. A priori ideas, self-evident universal truths, like those that the founders of the United States of America used to create the Constitution. We hold, create the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Self-evident. Well, Socrates is saying perfect beauty, perfect justice, perfect equality, etc. are ideas that we have, but those ideas do not come from experience. Because perfect beauty and justice don't exist here. So these are a priori ideas. Let's look at that. Justice, equality, goodness are a priori ideas. Self-evident, universal truths. Now where could we have gotten these ideas? We must have experienced them before we were born, Socrates argues. Think about it. It does seem that we have very definite innate ideas that we are born with. It does not seem, as some later philosophers will claim, that we are born a tabla rasa or a blank slate. It seems instead that we are born with certain ideas. Have you ever been around a three-year-old? Have you ever noticed that a three-year-old will say, it's not fair, when a three-year-old feels they're being treated unjustly? All little children, it's not fair. When was a three-year-old given a discourse on philosophy? Never. And yet, of course, the three-year-old knows exactly what fair is. And that's a rather complex idea. So where could it have come from? Now, of course, for the three-year-old, when they say it's not fair, they really mean it's not fair to me. <laughs> and that's usually where the center is. But still, the idea of fairness is there. And actually, there have been many psychological studies done recently which shows that there does seem to be an innate sense of morality in children as young as 18 to 36 years old. 36 months! 18 to 36 months old. That these children have an idea of empathy. That these children share. That children very young will be very upset when someone else is hurt. Mommy, what's wrong? I can remember myself at a very young age saying to my mother, it's not fair. You know what my mother said to me? She said, whoever told you the world was fair? I was devastated. No one had ever told me the world was fair. I just thought it should be. Most children think it should be. I still think it should be. But where could we possibly have gotten that idea? Well, Socrates said, if we are born with ideas, we must have existed before we were born. We must have existed in another world where we experienced perfect justice, where we experienced perfect goodness, where we experienced perfect beauty. That is why we have these ideas. So, If we have these ideas and we're born with them, we must have existed before we were born. Furthermore, Socrates goes on to argue 
that we must return to this world when we die. For where else would the souls that are born come from? And actually, Socrates goes on to argue, very much like Lao Tzu, that every opposite flows into the other and creates the other. Night flows into and creates day. Day flows into and creates night. Winter flows into and creates summer. Summer flows into and creates winter. And just as all opposites flow into and create one another, life and death must flow into and create one another. Therefore, we must be immortal souls that reincarnate. You see, Socrates believed in reincarnation just as did the Buddha, just as did many early philosophers and millions of people throughout time and actually millions of people today. But Socrates presented a detailed inductive and deductive argument for reincarnation, the immortality of the soul, and an objective existence of the good in another world that we know between lives. From these arguments for the objective existence of the good and the immortality of the soul, Socrates derived both his definition of the good and his justification for the good. In other words, why be good? You see, if we are immortal souls that reincarnate, then our bodies are just temporary. And if our bodies are just temporary, they are unimportant. What is important is the immortal soul. Actually, Socrates used the word psyche, and psyche means soul-mind in Greek. We'll look at that. Psyche, soul-mind. These were not separate ideas in Greek. But the important thing here is that the soul reincarnates. The soul is immortal, so the soul is what is important. The soul is the true self. So Socrates' definition of the good is that which nurtures the soul. Socrates' definition of evil is that which harms the soul. And from those definitions, the justification of the good becomes obvious. Why be good? In order to nurture your soul, in order to prevent your soul from being harmed. Because evil harms the soul. Why be good? Because happiness is dependent on goodness. Socrates went so far as to say that when one harms another, one harms themselves most. And therefore, it actually was better to suffer an injustice than to commit one. Because when we suffer an injustice, our bodies are harmed. But when we commit an injustice, our souls are harmed. Now, the, by that harm, Socrates did not mean that you might get caught or punished, that you might get in trouble or go to jail. What Socrates meant is the harm itself deteriorates the soul. It is like a smoker. Every cigarette a smoker has deteriorates their lungs, harms their health. But the smoker may not realize it. The smoker may think they're perfectly healthy because they've forgotten what it feels like to be healthy. Socrates would say it's the same for the soul. Every act of harm we commit deteriorates our soul. We may not realize it. We may indeed think we're fine. We may even think we're happy. But that is only because we have forgotten what true happiness feels like. Because it seems apparent, although we knew these concepts in another world of perfect justice, perfect goodness, and we remember them when we're young, we forget them. We forget them. We do harm ourselves. We do commit evil. But you see, Socrates would say that all evil comes from ignorance. Again, if we look at this definition of the good, remember, good versus evil. Good nurtures the soul, and evil harms the soul. Well, so Socrates would say nobody harms themselves on purpose. So if nobody harms themselves on purpose, all evil must be done from ignorance. In other words, when a human being commits evil, either they don't know it's evil, or they know it's evil, but they don't know they're hurting 
themselves. Let's look at that again. All evil is done from ignorance. What did Socrates mean? Either a person does not know an act is evil, or they realize their act is evil, but they don't realize it will harm themselves. So Socrates' basic contention is, if someone commits evil, it is only from ignorance, because no one harms themselves. Now, people have argued since then that that's ridiculous. People harm themselves all the time. They harm themselves knowing they're harming themselves. For instance, the cigarette smoker or the drug addict, they know they're harming themselves. Yes, but... Socrates believed education could cure this, but he wasn't talking about just any education. Socrates was talking about the pursuit and acquisition of wisdom. And it can be argued even today that wise people do not harm themselves. So, that is the difference. The education that Socrates used to try to cure evil was not the instilling of information or skills as actually much education is today. Socrates sought to cure evil by setting Athenians on the path to wisdom. And he sought to do this not by giving them information because Socrates believes that we know inside of ourselves what is good. We've just forgotten. And so we need to wake up and remember what our souls know. We need to be able to listen to our own souls. And then we will remember the good and in remembering the good, we will do the good. So instead of putting information and ideas into people, Socrates sought to draw it out. And the way he sought to do this was a Socratic dialogue or dialectic. Now, a Socratic dialogue is a question and answer format in which Socrates would question Athenian citizens about their most cherished beliefs. Anyone who purported to know what justice or beauty or equality was Socrates would question them about it. So they had to become conscious of and express these beliefs. And as they did, Socrates would question them further and force them to define their terms, to see if they knew what they were talking about. And in this question and answer process, Socrates would expose poor definitions and cloudy thinking. He thought by forcing self-examination, people would come to realize their own ignorance, they would come to realize their poor definitions, they would come to realize their cloudy thinking, and eventually they would come to realize what their soul already knows. Let's look at a Socratic dialectic, very important, question and answer format. It forces one to become conscious of and express their beliefs, it exposes ignorance, poor reasoning, and poor definitions, and it forces self-examination. Socrates believed that by forcing self-examination, one would realize their reasoning was poor, one would realize their definitions were poor, and one, in this questioning process, would remember their soul. Socrates also thought that by examining particular instances of virtue, one could remember virtue itself which was the other part of a Socratic dialogue. Through examining particular instances of virtues, we can begin to remember our experience of virtue. Now, virtue means excellence of function. A virtuous knife cuts well, for instance. Well, what does a virtuous human being do? A virtuous human being achieves excellence as a human being. And for Socrates and for Plato, that was done by acquiring specific virtues. So, virtue is excellence of function, and a human virtues are those qualities that lead to human excellence. And we know the virtues that concern Socrates and later Plato, because these are the, the, vir the virtues he questioned about. These are the virtues that Plato wrote on. The virtues that concern Socrates and Plato were justice, beauty, goodness, courage, temperance, or moderation. Socrates thought by, through the Socratic dialectic, by making people wake up to their own souls and by having them remember the virtues through examination of virtues, they would remember the good, that it was objective, that it existed, that it could be known, and they could do the good. Socrates used this to refute the sophists, 
Socrates, Socrates used this to argue that morality was not relative, that its existence could be proven and known. Socrates also used this to refute those Athenian aristocrats who wanted to go back to the old ways. Remember last week I spoke about the fact that in times of psychological and moral crisis, there's often two paths human beings take. Some people want to just throw out all values and say there are no real values, we can do whatever we want. Other people, they want to return to the old ways. They want to go back. This is the conservative position. Well, there were many other than the sophists in Athenian society who wanted to go back to the way things used to be. They wanted to go back to the worship of the old gods and goddesses. They believed that morality was a matter of divine command. But as we've seen since chapter 3, divine command theory as a way of determining morality is extremely difficult and has many problems. How do you figure out what the divine command is? Well, this was especially problematic for the 5th century Athenians because they had many gods and goddesses. And these gods and goddesses didn't always agree with one another. So Socrates was saying, we do not need to determine morality by divine command. We just need to remember what our souls already know. And so Socrates spent his days in the marketplace of Athens in his old cloak and barefoot, questioning the Athenian citizens about virtue and hoping he could get them to remember their souls. Now, these dialogues Plato writes quite beautifully about, but there's something that will be always missing when we read the Socratic dialogues, and that's the personality of Socrates himself. Socrates, some people wrote, was like an electric eel. He shocked you into a whole other level of awareness. There have been many teachers people have written about that their own level of consciousness actually makes you raise in conscious consciousness yourself simply by being around them. So in some ways we can't experience the Socratic dialogue in that way, but we still can experience the force and power of the method because Actually, the method is just as necessary today as it was in the 5th century Athens. Although some might say that the Athenian mind was more chaotic than ours, we still need to remember what Socrates was teaching. We are still subject to cloudy thinking. We are still subject to poor definitions. And perhaps even we need to remember our souls. This problem with definitions can be made really clear by a few examples. You've probably heard the idea that the only thing to fear is fear itself. Many people believe that if you just got rid of your fear, that you could be anything you wanted to be. That fear is the only thing that holds you, holds you back. In fact, people spend thousands of dollars on workshops to get rid of their fear. For example, they take fire walking workshops. These are workshops in which you walk barefoot over flaming hot coals. You overcome your fear, and when you get to the other side, overcoming your fear, you now can have mastery over your life. So fear is what inhibits you from achieving the best possible life. But then an author comes out with a new book. I saw him on Oprah. And he says, you need your fears. That human beings are indeed the only species that will ignore their fear. And in doing so, they get into trouble. As an example he used, the fact you're in a parking lot late at night, all by yourself, waiting for the elevator. And when the elevator arrives and opens, there's someone inside, and you feel afraid. But you don't want to be impolite, or you don't want to look like a wimp, or whatever. You get in the elevator, and you die. You should, that example, you should have listened to your fear. So. These people are saying, get rid of your fear. These people are saying, keep your fear. In fact, they could argue all night long. And the poor person in the self-help self -help section of the bookstore is like, what do I do? Keep my fear, get rid of my fear, keep my fear, get rid of my fear. Well, what's the problem here? Poor definitions. The people who are saying, get rid of your fear, are saying, get rid of your inhibitions, get rid of your anxieties, get rid of your self-doubts. 
The author is saying keep your fear, is saying keep your instincts and intuitions. You see, unless we know what we're talking about, we can become extraordinarily confused. And that confusion can even sometimes damage our lives. I've done some work on domestic violence. This, is, this yields an example of poor definitions leading to real danger. You see, many of the victims of domestic violence seek to forgive the person who has abused them. Sometimes it's for a religious reason, sometimes there are other reasons. Unfortunately, these people believe that forgiveness means allowing the person to come back in and hurt you again. That forgiveness is saying, you can move back in, it's all right, we'll forget about it. That's not forgiveness. That's boundarylessness. It's dangerous. Forgiveness is saying, I am not going to harbor hate in my heart. I am not going to seek revenge. I am not going to hunt you down and make you pay for what you did to me. And some extraordinary people may even wish well for the person who harmed them. But none of those things, releasing hate and forgiving debt and hoping well, None of those things mean, all right, come back in, hit me again, it's okay. But that happens. Poor definitions, even by people who are trying their best to be spiritual, to be good. Or imagine, a couple out on a date. I love you. I love you too. Are they talking about the same thing? Isn't it possible that one means, I love you tonight? And the other person means, I love you for the rest of my life and we're going to be monogamous? We have to learn to define our terms. <laughs> that is why vocabulary is so important, because if you don't have the vocabulary to figure out what the word meaning of words are, you are limited to cloudy thinking. So, we need to wake up too. Perhaps also we need to remember our souls, because if you believe in the existence of the soul, as did Socrates, you will realize that people spend very little time nurturing their soul. People spend tremendous amount of time pursuing wealth, or beauty, or power, going to the gym and putting on makeup and buying clothes and working for a job, but how much time is really spent on the soul? And this is what Socrates tried to get the Athenians to do, to wake up and remember their soul, and to remember that good nurtures the soul, and that they knew what good was. And in this doing so, in the Socratic dialogue, Socrates exposed the ignorance of the Athenian citizens. Now, exposing and examining your own ignorance is a very good idea. Exposing the ignorance of the people around you, especially the most powerful people in your state, can get you quite a few enemies. As Socrates, in his old cloak and his bare feet, questioned the leading citizens of Athens and pointed out that their definitions were poor and their thinking was cloudy, he didn't make himself really popular with them. No surprise. Now, of course, Socrates had many fans and ardent followers, especially among the young men of Athens. But among the older and the more powerful men of Athens, he had cr created quite a few enemies because they were quite invested in appearing wise and profound. Things were made much worse in 404 BC. In 404 BC, that is when Athens lost the Peloponnesian War. Sparta won. Sparta immediately dismantled the Athenian democracy. And as a matter of fact, Sparta put in charge of the democracy a committee of Athenian aristocrats, the oligarchy. Now, the oligarchy, these ancient families, ended up to be cruel and bloodthirsty. In fact, they spent their time and power lining their own pockets and taking revenge on their enemies. Now, in the process, they tried to get Socrates involved in their plans. They tried to threaten and seduce him into supporting what they were doing. And Socrates refused to do so. So in the process, he made even more enemies. Now, the aristocracy was so cruel and bloodthirsty that, in fact, the Athenian, the Athenian public revolted 
The Athenian aristocracy, the rule of the Athenian aristocracy only lasted for eight months. The Athenian people revolted and put the democracy back in place. Unfortunately, the democracy was also corrupt. The democracy also tried to get Socrates involved in their schemes, and once again, Socrates refused. So, the democracy had Socrates arrested. He was charged with corrupting the youth of the state. It was believed by some, or at least they purported to believe, that Socrates had corrupted the young minds of the men, the young men who had followed him. He was also accused of not worshiping the gods of the state. Socrates was arrested, he was tried, he was found guilty, and he was sentenced to death. Now, we won't have time to cover all those events, but they're well worth reading in Plato. Plato's description of these events are quite moving and powerful, actually, and have become very famous as literature. But we'll suffice to say that in these events, Socrates carried himself as he had in everything else. He sought to be good, and he sought to teach others what goodness was. In fact, as he was imprisoned awaiting his execution, his friends had bribed the guards and ensured his escape. And when they came and asked him to escape, Socrates refused to do so. Socrates said that it is easier to escape death than it is injustice. You see, Socrates believed that it would be unjust to break the laws of Athens. He argued that he had lived in Athens all his life and he had enjoyed the privileges of being an Athenian citizen. And just because some people had used, used those laws to commit an injustice did not give him reason to commit an injustice himself by breaking those laws. Socrates argued that one, had, one disagreed with the laws of their state they had a right to work to reform those laws and change them, or they had a right to leave the state. But they did not have the right to break those laws. Obviously in this, Socrates disagrees with Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail that we discussed. He also disagrees with Henry David Thoreau and Nelson Mandela and those others who have committed acts of civil disobedience, nonviolent civil disobedience. It'll be interesting, you'll have to think, who do you agree with? This difference between love it or leave it and this difference of nonviolent civil disobedience would come to a real head between two generations during the Vietnam War. The older generation holding that you could not break the laws of the state in order to reform those laws. The younger generation saying that if laws are unjust, they must indeed be broken. Socrates, however, had another reason for not escaping. Socrates said that his inner voice, which had guided him all his life, did not indicate that death would be a bad thing, did not indicate that he should attempt to escape death. He said all through his life, when he was about to do something that was wrong, this inner voice would speak to him and let him know that it was wrong. It didn't always tell him what to do, which was right, but it would let him know when something was wrong. And yet, through all this time, leading up to his death, this inner voice had not spoken to indicate that it was wrong. So it must be the right thing to do. And finally, Socrates believed that in death he would return to the other world, where perfect justice, perfect beauty, and perfect goodness existed that in fact that he was going to a far, far better place. So, why should he resist death? In fact, in death would be the fulfillment of his life. In death, he would then be able to see the good perfectly. Because Socrates argued that, while we are in body, our desires distract us from seeing with the purity of our souls. Not only do we spend our time chasing down our desires and do our hungers and our needs and our lusts call to us, but we cannot 
remember the perfect good as long as we're in our body. And Socrates argues, that did, as did Buddha, that our desires tie us to the body and in fact tie us to this cycle of reincarnation. There are actually quite a lot of similarities as you've seen through this episode between the teachings of Lao Tzu and Buddha and Socrates. Like Lao Tzu, Socrates believed in the relinquishment of personal will. Like Lao Tzu, Socrates believed that uh, morality was objective and knowable, that when one harms another, one harms themselves most. And like the Buddha, Socrates believed that we reincarnate and that we are released from that cycle by releasing our desires and by moral rightness. Mm -hmm. In some ways, ultimately, Socrates' moral theory may be considered to be like intuitionism. Socrates said he heard an inner voice. Or Socrates, in remembering our souls, we would know within us what is good. In fact, in the 19th century, Ralph Waldo Emerson would write, there is guidance for each of us, and by lowly listening, we will hear the right word. Intuitionism is flawed as a moral theory, too, because it leaves us no way to settle disputes. My intuition may be one thing and yours another. So as a method, it has its flaws, but Socrates wasn't really concerned with giving us a specific method for knowing the good in any specific situation. Socrates was concerned in proving that the good was moral and objective, that we could know it, and that it was essential to human happiness. In doing this, Socrates changed Western history. Most importantly, he changed Plato. And Plato will be one of the most important influences on Western history. And we'll do that next episode. See you next time.